Hello and a very warm welcome to the last Real Home Show of 2019. Coming up, everything you need to know about garage conversions. We put the leading cordless vacuums to the test. The lowdown on smart TVs. How to clear the clutter and go minimalist. Plus, we've got a design package with Mark Muir Architects worth £1,200 to give away. If your house has felt decidedly cramped this Christmas, you may have considered converting your garage. Here's everything you need to know before turning that unloved dumping ground into usable space. If you need more space but you don't want to extend, then converting your garage could be the most cost-effective solution. Today we're in a kitchen which was once a garage. Unfortunately, the owner doesn't actually like it that much. It was completed before their current owner bought the house and it showcases many of the pitfalls that you need to avoid if you're planning a similar project. So here are the five things that you need to consider carefully before you start converting your garage. So first up, consider how you'll use it. Garages are obviously built for storing cars, so they tend to be long and narrow, which can pose real problems when trying to turn them into usable living spaces. At two and a half meters wide, this kitchen is just about big enough for cooking, but it doesn't really lend itself to entertaining or even dining. So instead of turning your garage into a primary living room, like a kitchen or a lounge, consider whether it would be better divided into ancillary rooms, maybe a utility or a study, and that will then free up room within the rest of the house. Secondly, it will cost significantly less than an extension. Expect to pay between seven and 15,000 pounds for the conversion, excluding any kitchens or bathrooms that you want to install. For this, you'll get the new opening created into the house, if there isn't one already in existence, and you'll also get your existing garage door replaced with a wall and window, just like this. And then it's a case of insulating, extending the heating and utilities, and raising the floor level. Make sure that you invest in conversion insurance from a company like Self Build Zone, which will cover the work that's been carried out, but also your existing house too. It should also cover materials, plant tools, and equipment. Thirdly, you need to think about lighting. So in this kitchen, all of the lights are either on or off, and it would have been much better if the previous owners had considered lighting more carefully. Think about providing a combination of general task and accent lighting. So that means layering ceiling spotlights with pendants over your dining table or desk, and then lamps or wall lights for atmosphere. If you've got a single story garage, think about adding roof lights, which will bring in loads of natural light from above. And always go for the biggest windows that you can when you're replacing that garage door. In fourth place, you probably won't need planning permission as it's likely to be covered by permitted development rights. However, there are some exceptions to this, such as if you live in a listed property or a conservation area. So as a safeguard for the future, it's worth applying to your local authority for a certificate of lawful development. That's before you start the garage conversion work and it costs about £117, which is half the price of a full planning application. And don't forget, as a garage conversion contains significant alterations, including adding electrics, plumbing and structural work, it's subject to building regulations and will need to be signed off by a building control officer. In fifth place, think about longevity. So one of the biggest bugbears with this kitchen is that the boiler has been left in what is now the middle of the room. Think about how you'll use the space in the future and then plan in the sockets, lighting, heating and water supply accordingly. For instance, you could think you want the space as a playroom now, but it could later become a home office and then a downstairs bedroom. And don't forget to factor in plenty of storage for all of those things that are currently stashed in the garage. You might even need to invest in a shed or garden room to compensate, or you could leave a small section of the existing garage as a store. Finally, don't scrimp on the details. Make sure that the floor level matches the existing house as much as you can, because you can bet your bottom dollar it'll put off potential buyers if it doesn't. So there you have it, the five things that you need to know before converting your garage. Head to realhomes.com forward slash TV for a typical garage conversion build schedule and join me in the new year for our new series on planning your dream extension. Now, many of us are switching our corded vacuums for cordless models, but with so many on the market, which should you choose? We've put the latest Shark, Vax and Dyson models to the test. Join me afterwards for our non-techie guide to smart TVs. 
these days, many of us are opting for a cordless vacuum instead of a traditional corded model. But it can seem like there's a new cordless vacuum released every day, offering improved battery life or even better suction. So we've taken three of the newest, best performing models and we're going to put them to the test on the things that really matter. So number one, how well do they clean? Number two, how long do they run for? And number three, how easy are they to empty? So let's introduce you to the contenders. First up, we've got the Shark Duo Clean with Flexology. Now that's that nifty little hose. You can see it's folded over. It means you can get underneath furniture. This one comes with a five-year warranty and the RRP is 47999. In the center, we've got the Dyson V11 Absolute. Now this one says that it has 60 minute runtime, as does the Shark. It costs slightly more, it's 499, but it does come with a digital screen and a torque head that should adjust to the surface that you're putting it on without you having to change the suction. Finally, we've got the Vax Blade 2 Max, which is the cheapest of the bunch. Retails at 199 pounds. If you buy it direct from the retailer, you get the free tool set that we've got there. Otherwise, it doesn't come with those extra heads. With this one, you get a three-year warranty as opposed to two with the Dyson. So what we're going to do, I've made a nice little mix of breadcrumbs and cornflakes, which I'm sure we all get on our floors. We we'll sprinkle them on hard floor and carpet and see how they perform. So they're fully charged. We'll test the runtime claims in a minute, but for now, let's see how well they pick up dirt on these different surfaces. So we've got carpet and hard floor. So next up, we've got the Dyson V11 Absolute. Now this has a nifty little LCD display here. So I've set it to auto, which should mean that it adjusts its own suction. So it should count differently with the hard floor to the carpeted floor. So all I need to do is pull the trigger and let's see how it gets on. Okay, so moving on to the last one in our text, this is the Shark Duo Clean. Now you might notice it's folded over at the moment, so this is the flexology that it comes with. So all you do is press the release button and then it pops up to full height, so really handy for storage. And it also means you can press that when you're vacuuming and can you see it means that you can go under furniture, which is quite handy. So put it back in upright mode and let's see how it gets on. So there you have it, we finished the test. Now, what I think's happened here is the more advanced heads that we've got on the Dyson and the Shark have performed much better. They haven't sprayed everything around, they've picked it up really well and they were both very efficient on both surfaces, adapting to what was going on. But they do cost a lot more money than the Vax. However, bearing in mind that this is less than half the price of the other two, has performed really well, particularly on the carpet. The only thing I'd say is on the hard floor, the head doesn't seem to suck everything up quite as well because you've got a few bits that have kind of come out the back and the sides. Now breadcrumbs, cornflakes are quite tricky but realistically they're things that you are going to get in your house on the floor. So let's move on, let's see how easy they are to empty because there's nothing worse than making a big mess again every time you come to empty your hoover. Okay so starting with the vax, with this one the actual tank comes off so you don't have to worry about carrying all the handle to your bin. It's quite easy to pop off. I did have a little bit of difficulty getting it back on first time but after a couple of practices very simple to do. With the Dyson, it looks like it's got a much bigger tank than the others actually, but you have to take the whole of the handle section across to the bin with you. That said, it's very easy to do and it's got very powerful ejection mode, which uh, can seem a little bit violent, but it does really push everything out. And it's very easy to put back on. And with the Shark, it actually took me a couple of goes to take the head off this one, but once I did, it was really simple to empty and very simple to get back on. Okay, so we've tested how well they clean up and how easy they are to empty, but now it's the really big question, how how long do they actually run for? What we're going to do is set them on the most economical mode on carpet and leave them to it and time how long it takes them before they cut out. So stopwatch at the ready. I've had a nap and they've finally given up the ghost. So in terms of which one overperformed, good news, the Dyson and the Vax both lasted longer than they said they would. So slightly over 45 minutes for the Vax and slightly over 60 minutes for the Dyson. Unfortunately, the Shark didn't make it to the 60 minutes that it claimed it would, but we're not sure exactly which setting it's meant to be on to deliver 60 minutes. We had it on carpet. So perhaps if you had it on the hard floor setting, it would have lasted that little bit longer. It was just under the 60 minutes. 
So to summarise, if I was going to choose, having done these three tests, I think I'd go for the Dyson. If I was replacing a traditional corded vacuum, you really want that really good suction, quite a big tank, the ability for it to just automatically adjust for different surfaces, and the LED screen's really helpful. You just click one button to switch between modes and to see what the battery's doing. The Shark, if you've got small space, I think the Shark is the clear winner. The fact you can flip it over like that, I mean, you could just pop it behind the sofa, you really could. And it's also really handy for getting under beds under cupboards, all of those awkward to reach areas. I just didn't feel it picked up everything quite as quickly as the Dyson. So that's the only reason it's my kind of second place. If budget was my biggest concern, I was looking for a really good deal, I would definitely go for the Vax Blade 2 Max. This one, it's really lightweight, it's nice and easy to store, it's got relatively good suction, very easy to empty, and it lasts a really long time. The only reason that it's not quite as well performing as the others is the head is just that little bit smaller and it doesn't quite suck everything in, whereas the other two do. So there you have it, choice is yours. Hurry up and you could make some massive savings on your favourite cordless vacuum in the New Year sales. Now, if you've already binge watched everything from the crown to flea bag, then you need to know more about smart TVs. Here's our tech expert Verity with the key features to look out for. Remember when TVs had four channels and were so bulky you'd struggle to reach around the back to clean them? It's safe to say things have changed a lot since then and smart TVs are just the latest part of that journey. A smart TV is one that connects to the internet in order to stream on-demand content from the likes of BBC iPlayer and Netflix alongside your live TV channels. Wi-Fi connectivity also gives the opportunity to accept over-the-air firmware updates as and when they're released by the manufacturer to keep your TV bug-free and running smoothly. There's a wealth of brilliant programming available online, from films and documentaries to kids' shows and sitcoms. If you like to have a great choice of things to watch, then a smart TV gives you just that. Luckily, unless you're shopping at the very, very budget end of the market, most TVs these days will include a smart TV offering of some description. Already got a TV that you like but you want to bring it up to date? You can add smart functionality to your TV using something like Amazon Fire TV Stick or Apple TV. These will need a spare HDMI port to be connected though, so it will still need to be a relatively modern TV. If you're buying a smart TV, you'll likely find that most of the big brands will include support for the big name streaming services, things like Netflix, iPlayer, Amazon Prime Video and YouTube. But other catch-up services like Sky's Now TV are a bit more dependent on brand. That said, you should consider many more things above smart performance when buying a smart TV. It'll depend on your budget, but even the lower budget should now be considering a 4K set with HDR support for the best picture quality. If you've got the money to spend though, OLED sets from the likes of LG, Sony and Panasonic or QLED sets from Samsung are the best that's out there right now. Samsung also has its own range of design-focused sets called The Frame. They're smart in a very different way, in that when they're not in use, they can display art and, if wall-mounted, can look like a picture frame sitting on your wall. In terms of cost, smart TVs are now really very cheap indeed, and depending on the brand, you could pick one up from around £250. However, it will be the picture performance and the TV technology that you'll be compromising on at the lower prices, rather than the smart system itself. When it comes to installation, smart TVs are super easy to set up. You'll go into the network menu, find your Wi-Fi network and fill in your password. If you prefer, you can usually hardwire your TV to your router via an Ethernet cable. So what are the brands that you should consider? Well, some of the best picture quality you'll find will come from the brands you'll have heard of. Brands like LG, Sony, Panasonic and Samsung. Though you can get great picture quality for less from the likes of Hisense and Sharp. My advice? Look out for a bargain in the Boxing Day or New Year sales and you won't regret it. For more on making your home smarter, just head to realhomes.com forward slash technology. Now, if you're desperate to restore some order to your home after the festive madness, here's our guide to minimalist interiors. Stick around for our architectural design giveaway. It's time for the part of the show where I am joined by the lovely Anna Morley. She would be an interior designer to the stars, but they won't let her in. <laughs> Okay. It's time for our design deck to say it's a fond farewell to us because this is its last episode. Aww. But we chose minimalism did. as our look for this time. Yep. So, Anna, please tell me what minimalism is. Well, minimalism, very quiet, subdued, 
a little bit stark, if I can say that. Anything that was there had a purpose. That's, and minimalism is basically like that, is a, a scheme of restraint. It's quite architectural as well, isn't it? Like Very much so, it is. If you have a feature of the house, you kind of want to show that off rather than all your possessions fighting to be the stars of the show. So what rooms does it look in? I feel like if you go in minimalist, you've kind of got to go the whole yeah. house, haven't you? I would say, yes, you're right. It's definitely something if you're a minimalist, you're going to go at it through the whole house. But probably if you were just going to have it in one room, the bedroom, where you have the, you want the space, the quiet, the peace, the, oh, the room to breathe. I feel like I know the answer to this, but what colours should I be looking for? <laughs> Textures, or should I be looking for a, a lack of colour? <laughs> no, you don't want a lack of colour. Um, you you want to, yes, probably you want a, a neutral colour palette. You don't want to be going with your crazies. Um, you want to choose colour sort of sparingly that if you are going to inject some in. Um, the new uh, Dulux's Colour of the Year, Tranquil Dawn, is very good for this because it's very restful. It was designed with that in mind. So yeah, you want to go down to the, uh, the the cooler, calmer end of the spectrum. In terms of finishes, I've seen like a lot of concrete and kind of natural materials. But what are the the finishes that you should be looking for? So um, you want to add in a bit of texture. We've talked about Scandinavians before, and they do have a lot of texture. So you kind of want to apply that a bit this way as well. So you want a fabric um, sofa, or you want to inject some nice cushions, maybe with some. Um, you know, some fur or something just to kind of give a little bit more some velvets. Um, you would like, you know, if you're going to have a rug down, keep it with solid colours, but do, you know, do use a rug because you still need that to soften a, soften a space. Some jute here and there. So it feels like quite a high-end architectural mm. look. Can you do it on a budget? Definitely you can do it on a budget. Probably the easiest one of everything we've t spoken about this past series to do because it's all about clearing away, getting rid of rather than injecting in. Not to say there's not things in within the space, but it is more about having a clean floor, having paired back walls, surfaces. So you really want to declutter. And of course, if you have items that are saleable, you can make a little bit of money as well if you want to. If you're into that sort of thing. One person's trash. Precisely, Laura. Indeed. So, is there a hero piece for this look, or is it more about just the cohesive feel of it? Um, so, perhaps we, one would say the bin, the skip, charity shop bag. Um, so, obviously, after you've cleared everything away, but you do need somewhere to store your essentials. So, I would say storage. You want something streamlined and attractive that will go in your scheme, that perhaps you can display your treasured possessions on. Because it's not about having absolutely nothing. It's about having some really key pieces that will really stand out against the rest of the scheme. On that note, Anna, I think it's time to let you go and stalk some more celebrities. <laughs> Thank you. One of them will say I've yes. I've got a whole time. list. <laughs> so, design deck, it's gone. See ya. Join us next time and we'll be looking at interior design trends for 2020. It's the end of the show, so it's time for our latest amazing competition. We've teamed up with Mark Muir Architects to give one lucky viewer the chance to win an exclusive design package for a self-build renovation project, which includes a consultation, scale sketches and CAD design. To be in with a chance of winning, click on the top article at realhomes.com forward slash TV and answer this simple multiple choice question. What kind of conversion did our small space squad discuss in this episode? Now you've got until midnight on January the 16th to enter, so good luck. That's it for now, but join me in 2020 for more amazing ideas to transform your home and garden on any budget. In the meantime, head to realhomes.com forward slash TV for more on anything we've mentioned in this show. And don't forget to pick up a copy of Real Homes magazine. Happy homemaking.